fans all around the world. I'm Nancy McGee. I'm the Vice President of Education for the Commemorative Air Force. And with me today is none other than the Carnig Tomasian. And I'm so excited we finally got to do this, Carnig. Right. It's great to have you here. Oh, wow. So we were supposed to have done this a couple weeks ago, but you had no electricity. What happened there? Well, uh, we had a big storm, number one, and the storm blew down trees and so on, and uh, the electric wires were shorted. It was uh, not a local thing. It took out half the uh, area here. It was, uh, it was pretty debilitating in terms of the things that you could have in in your place. We had to use flashlights, and fortunately, uh, I have a patio, so I'm on the first floor, so I could get out of my uh, apartment. So my wife and I used to go. We we lived on my patio because it was uh, much more pleasant and it got out you know even though you're not going anywhere you felt like you were going out <laughs> absolutely make believe anyway we did enjoy that part of it and uh uh let's see what else would you like to know I just wanted to know that you're safe, and I want to thank you. Our, our uh, organization, this is Cedar Crest, and they are very well organized. The leaders here, we have no uh, cases right now. None. Good. Good. So, you know, that's remarkable. But it is remarkable because all the members are striving to listen to the way things should be done. Whereas we don't have kids here, wise ass kids, see, they know everything, they can go out and do anything. Well, let Sonny boy, you're gonna find out it isn't quite that way. And uh, we've all learned those lessons. I was a kid once, stupid and everything. So <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, done that. And so, all right. Well, glad you're safe. And I'm glad that the audience tuned in today again so that we could finally get to meet you and talk to Karnik Tomasian. You are a B-29 tail gunner, I believe. No, and waist gunner. Waste gunner. My apologies. Yep. And a uh, prisoner of war and and a, a, an illustrious career in marketing, advertising, and as an artist, you have really made your way there. So you've done an awful lot to support CAF and programs and kids and education. And you were very kind today to talk to us about your experience in World War II uh, with the B-29 and as a prisoner of war and the, what that was like and lessons learned. And we've already heard one of them, just pay attention to the rules and stay safe, right? Oh, yeah. Pay attention to the rules, is right. right. All right, well, I'm going to share my screen here so that we can get started with oh. a few images that you're going to speak to. And there we go. So, Carnig, tell me about when you were a young man, like this picture of you in uniform, how old were you and how did your involvement with World War II begin? Well, at this, this particular picture, I was, uh, I think, 19. I went in at 18 and I went to various schools. Uh, because uh, I, I couldn't go into flying school because my eyes were not up to par. And so I stayed in the Air Force <clears throat> and I went to various schools like electrical specialist school, mechanic school, and so on until 
Do you want me to go through the routine of how things developed? We got time, right? We do, absolutely. All right. So uh, after our my initial uh, experience in the various mechanics schools, went to Chanute Field in Chicago for electrical specialist school which i enjoyed very much uh, like electricity and so on and i happened to have pretty good marks apparently because they asked some of us if we would like to enter a program which involved a new bomber you know what the bomber was but i said jeez yes that's for me so uh the idea was that because of our marks we would be able to train as engineers flight engineers on each uh, plane each plane had one of these all right so we went to washington state of washington seattle washington and uh, there we met with the engineers, the original engineers of the plane, teaching us about the plane. We had still hadn't seen the plane. We saw big struts. We saw wheels that were enormous. We saw we saw, everything we saw was really uh, invigorating our interest in the whole project. Till one day, uh, some of the guys heard engines roaring, and uh, the way this Boeing aircraft factory was on the bottom of a big valley, and we, our school was at the top of the valley. So you had this valley, and on the bottom of the valley at the far end was the Boeing factory and one of the guys said hey I hear airplanes so we all ran out to the edge of the thing and looked down into the valley and there they were the B-17 and behind it was the B-29 it was our first glimpse of what we were studying for and I, I, it's hard to uh, convey the excitement because this was the first time that we so actually saw a B-29. Well, the B-17 revved up and off it went, using up most of the runway. Then came the roar, I mean the roar of the B-29. And the brakes let go and it virtually lurched forward and zoomed up and we let out a whoop you would never believe. It it put reality, hey, this is this is what we're fighting for. This is what we're trying to learn about. And uh, oh, how bad, it's exciting, you know? Well, we went back to classes, and to make a long story short, I left high school to get into the service, and, in, and I was finishing up my high school and the diploma in the service. These other guys, they were college grads. They were in engineering. They were up so far above us, the ones few like me, that we hadn't had a chance of uh, competing with them. And make a long story short again, we were weeded out and sent to gunnery school. Now, this gunnery school was not the gunnery school that was on B-17s, these were gunnery schools 
that had to do with the B-29 system. What is that system? Well, the B-29 had various turrets, one in the front, one in the back, both at the top, one in the tail, and two in the bottom. And these turrets, there was no, uh, like in a B-17, you held the guns. Nothing. It was a small sight about that big. And it had two uh, wheels that you would turn in order to bring the focus in or the focus out. And in the middle was a glass. It sounds complicated. And very honestly, it was complicated. Mm -hmm. Because I ended up in the heat of battle. I just used my sight and watched my, because every third bullet uh, was a tracer. So I could see where my bullets were going. And I would be able to shoot and hit somebody. Having gone through that uh, schoolie, we finally, were sent to gunnery school and uh, went through all that and then down to Clovis, New Mexico, where we trained, not on B-29s, on B-17s, because there were no B-29s yet. But we were all being groomed to be crews on a B-29. And uh, so therefore, we learned about the gun system when we were in the gunnery school. It's a different system altogether. And uh, then in Clovis, we formed crews. And ultimately, we had our final crew organized and we were lucky. We got a pilot, Doc Traber. He was an incredible man. And uh, he had a lot of experience down South America with heavy bombers and so on. And so when we were um, formed as a crew, they took our pilot, not him, the original pilot, and made him an instructor for other pilots. And Doc Tramer came as our permanent pilot. Well, let me tell you, this guy, he was an incredible man. And uh, not only in his prowess as a pilot, but as a human being, he was fantastic. And uh, we all respected him. Uh, I'll tell you what, in, in our practice sessions, we would, well, we would go and fly over the mountains in uh, New Mexico and go down there. And, and so we devised a thought we, because Doc always wanted to complete the mission, never go somewhere else and drop in for a half a day or whatever and go see the town. No, no, no. We complete the mission today all right so not knowing this stupidly we come out of the plane in our suntans not our work clothes our suntans he took one look at that and the reason we did this is we oh yeah i forgot to tell you we uh, when we went over the mountain we opened our oxygen valves ah. so 
we were over there, we flew around and everything. And then the flight engineer said, uh, Doc, uh, we better go and uh, get a, more oxygen. We're, we're running out of it. We won't have enough to go back over. Oh, okay. So we landed. And that's when we came out with our suntans. Well, this wonderful man that I'm praising, he blew his top. You would not, I don't want to say what he said. <laughs> but get your asses in that plane now. He knew exactly what happened. He mm -hmm. takes no ball, no nuts. And we sheepishly went back to our base. And he said, don't ever pull anything like that on me again. I says, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, these are some of the crazy things. But it shows you his incredible tenacity to do things right. And yeah. you had to respect him, which we all did. And we were very fortunate in having a flight engineer who was absolutely unbelievable. He designed engines. He was in college doing this. We were competing for that kind of job. I'd have killed people. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was, uh, Bert Pomeley was his name, and uh, he was a fantastic flight engineer. Oh boy, we all listened to everything he said because he knew what he was talking about. And, uh, and we're kids, you know, what was I? Uh, by that time, let's see, well, I'm in the, almost two years, I'm approaching 20. And the other guys were like me. Yeah. So, uh, uh, let's see, where was I? <laughs> so, one of my problems. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, you were flying B 17s and then you moved to B 29s. Right. We, uh, they told us uh, you're now going to go and pick up your own B 29 and fly it to India. Okay. Sounds exciting. So uh, we flew uh, in a B-17 to Wichita, Kansas, where our shiny, beautiful B-29 was. Oh, man, I can't tell you. So the next day, we had to go up into a flight. Uh, we flew around mostly for the pilot, co-pilot, and the engineer and so on for them not for the gunners so i went uh, at one point i went through the tunnel you know that they have a tunnel in the b29 you can go from the back end to the front and it also was pressurized okay this was the first pressurized plane bomber and uh I went and joined them, and I said, so Doc said, hi, Tommy. Yeah, he called me Tommy. Connick didn't make it then. <laughs> so it was Tommy. Anyway, he uh, said, you want to try to fly to a plane? I said, sure. So Chet Paul, our uh, co-pilot, a dear friend of mine, he got up, and I sat down, and I was, should have got in the plane. It, it, it go flew itself very honestly. I didn't do anything really, but it felt great. It felt like I was doing something, but uh, in, in reality, I wasn't. And finally, Doc said, oh, finally, I happened to look up and I saw a cloud bank, a big one. And I said, oh, Doc, uh, you want to take over? And he says, Tommy, you've been flying instruments since you sat there. Go ahead and continue flying instruments. 
you got to learn to look around. What's the matter with you? <laughs> you think you were the only one in the, in the air? Well, boy, he really tore me down. Anyway, but he meant well. And so I, I went through the cloud bank and worked out a fine. So anyway, later on, we next few days, we finally got to the point where we were going to go overseas. And we go to Bur uh, Florida, land, gas up, and uh, we go, next stop is Barinquin Field in Puerto Rico. And you say, why? Well, I'll tell you why. The officers wanted to pick up liquor. <laughs> 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 well, of course, we don't. This is a long time ago. <laughs> and so we did that. But then we went to Belém, Brazil. In Belém, Brazil, it's right on the coast. And uh, the, the flight engineer realized they were inspecting everything and the gas tank in one of the plane uh, wings uh, was leaking. It had a leak in it. So what does that mean? That means we have a holiday for about two, three weeks because uh the the tank had to be flown down to us and then installed you can imagine anyway so what we did we went down to the beach because we weren't allowed to go to the city because i don't know they felt who knows the spies be the, i really don't know uh anyway so that's what we did and uh uh the uh let's see it took about three weeks and finally we got the word everything's fine and we went and flew over the atlantic to uh accra accra a-c-c-r-a on the uh let's see the western coast of africa and there we it was a british place so we could hear the british uh what do you call it ground and in, in, in instructions oh rotos huh? and so we we landed and then uh, we got our gas and everything and then went over and now this is the rainy season in india and when it rains there it's like rain nowhere else it rains so we had to stay in khartoum egyptian sudan this was an old no not an old well it was a british base and all concrete structures and everything so we stayed there and we uh, we played cards and looked at movies and generally wasted our time and finally uh, the time came when we were going to leave and in this place there was these young boys and their fathers they used to come and sweep up the place and keep things neat and fix our bunks and so on. So this one young fellow, young kid, a sweet kid, he came over to me and he says, Sai, I want to go with you to America. I said, hey, well, we're not going to America. We're going to war. We we can't take it. So I work for you. Don't worry. I'll do everything you need. I said, 
well, why do you feel this? I know. I know you are white. Well, in the sun, I get very dark, especially down there. You know, mm -hmm. not the sun like you get in America. This is different sun. And I was dark. So he thought that here is a white man. He knew I was white. And now I look like a brown man. So he thought when he came to America, he looked like a white man. Hmm. I mean, what kind of a concept? Yeah. Anyway, I, I didn't ridicule him. I said, look, sure. this is all because of the sun. And we can't really take you with us. You understand, we're going to war. And he said, I understand you're going to war, but uh, uh, I will help, I will clean up, I will do anything. And I said, you really can't do it. We're not allowed to do it. So came the time, the next uh, day or so, uh, we got word that we can go to uh, Karachi in India, which was our first stop. So we ended up and uh, we're taking, ready to take off and who comes by like little Tom Sawyer with the bag on the end of a stick. I, oh. I, I've never in my life forget that image of this sweet little boy. I uh, wonder, you know, in retrospect, uh, how, is, how is he now? Mm -hmm. Has he grown into a nice human being? Or he's, has he been coerced into the madness that's gone over there? I don't know. Anyway, we finally took off. And uh, we had a little accident. Our, our, uh, we have a floating boat. <laughs> You know that it it, it uh, you put uh, it it inflates. Well, it inflated right out of our ship, so we had to go back land and get another one, and then we took off again. So we got to Karachi, and in Karachi it was raining, raining, and we had um, our flight engineer said, "Look, we got to." fix the uh, cowling on these uh, on the engines. There was something wrong with them. I said, OK, so we did that. <coughs> and then Vernon Henning, my dear friend, he was we were real buddies. We did everything together. And uh, so we got out into the city and we saw this rickshaw. And uh, in fact, we saw two rickshaws. So we told them, hey, can I ride this thing? We give you a couple of piastres. You know, we had that money that they used. So we did. Well, bad news for them. They were so frightened. They sat in the back while we Vernon and I raced down the streets and there were cows, you know, the, I mean, uh, fortunately, we didn't destroy anything. And we gave them a lot of piastres after that. <laughs> but it was such fun. So finally, uh, time came, the monsoons were lessening and they got word we can go to Chukulia. So we went to Chukulia and we land in the rain and we go to the place where we get our bedding and all that and uh mccutcheon sees this big olive drab box and imprinted on it was missing in action she's turned around to us and said you know you get killed out here oh yeah <laughs> 
the idea. Anyway, we finally got into the system and the system was such that we had our barracks and we had our bearers that cleaned up our barracks and so on. And uh, the form was that we would spend X number of missions and you'd get back and start to service the planes. What do I mean by that? Well, in my case, I had a battery charger and I had a bearer and uh, we went to every plane it, that would come down because between every mission to China, we had to ferry our own gas over the hump. You know, no need for gunners because what are we gonna do? We're not gonna fight. One bullet in the wrong place, that plane is gone. So it's, so anyway, what we did was we'd stand on the line and as the planes came in, this came day and night, round and round and round and round over the hump, gallons, on thousands of gallons of gas. We had four uh, forward bases and we had, besides Chikulia, there was other bases. They did the same thing and they ferry the gas over the hump. And finally came time when we were uh, just go down the coast, all right? And uh, in the coast, we would go to Singapore. And drop some bombs and come back. And then comes a time that we're going to go over uh, to China over the hump, land at our base. There were four forward bases for the four bases in India. They each used their own base and pick up gas. We brought our own bombs. And in this particular instance, we went to Mutton, Manchuria. We were going to go into Japan, but I don't know what happened. I, I frankly, I forgot, all right, to be honest. <laughs> anyway, it really doesn't matter. The point was that we went there and uh, we dropped our bombs in Mukden, Manchuria. And on the way back and while we were there, people were shooting at us and everything and we were shooting at them. And I remember one guy came right in front of me and went out. I, mean, I didn't have time to do anything. <laughs> it was unbelievable. He could have cracked into us. He was that close. Anyway, uh, so finally, uh, on the way back, uh, we got our end, one of the engines got shot up. So uh, our uh, pilot, Doc Tramer, asked us all, look, here's the deal. Our engines aren't going to have us keep up with the rest of the group. So that means we're going to be alone. And uh, we're close to Russia. And we could go and intern there, but I want to get your feelings about that. Well, before he finished, there was such a big no that he got the message. <laughs> he said, that's it. That's all I need to know. <laughs> so we hobbled back. We made it back, thank God. Yeah, so uh, about, about a week later, now this is December 
13th, we got a meeting about the next mission. And December 13th, we went to this meeting place and our Colonel Blanchard and the bomb director and so on, they told us we're going to bomb Rangoon, Burma. Oh, oh okay. So I've got uh, a map up here for you for our audience so they can see where Rangoon is in Burma. Yeah. Do they see it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because I, I can't point it, right? Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, Rangoon, Burma. And uh, actually, forgive me, uh, it was Bangkok, Thailand. That's what it was. Bangkok was the first one. And it was a bridge in Bangkok. And in order to bomb a bridge, you cannot have delayed action bombs. They have to blow on impact which meant there are no fuses, which also meant as soon as they release from the plane, they're armed. Our commander, Colonel Blanchard, I'd like to say some, nothing, I won't. Uh, he ordered that 500 pounders were going to be mixed with the thousand pounders on the airplane and released as one. Now, I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to understand that is such a dangerous load. Number one, to have two different uh weights of bombs going down one straightens out faster than the lesser one and seeing that none of them have fuses as soon as they touch that's it mm -hmm. well, the lead commander uh bombardier rather went to colonel blanchard and told him this, and Colonel Blanchard said, uh, I'll call LeMay, and he called LeMay, and LeMay wasn't there. So the next in command told him, well, Blanchard, you decide on your own. So he said, all right, to the, our uh, bombardier, you either go on this mission or you're court-martialed. So we went on the mission. Now, none of us knew all this beforehand. I'm telling you things I learned after. I didn't know anything about this. And uh, so uh, we went on the mission, took off. One plane out of 12 uh, had some problems, so they got back. They had to go back into the land again. So we had 11 ships going on to this target. We tried twice to go over it, but it was cloud covered. And the bombardier said, look, we can't, we, we're not going to be able to hit the, it's the, uh, the bridge, we can't see it. So the order came to go to the secondary target, which was Rangoon, Burma. And there we were supposed to bomb a airfield and stuff like that. Well, we got to Burma, I mean to Rangoon, Burma and uh, it was my turn to sit at the hatchway to the bomb bay 
the reason for that is you tell the bombardier by the intercorn that all the bombs were released. Otherwise, we have to depressurize and kick it out physically. It's, it's, it's a problem. Anyway, so it was my turn. McCutcheon had done it before, now it's my turn. Probably had a lot to do with saving my life. Who knows? And uh, so we're going over and uh, I hear bombs released and the bombs were released and, and then an enormous, I mean, I've never in my life before or since or even in the movies today seen a blast, everything everything was bright red at our plane that big b-29 flipped over like this and went completely around we as a plane next to us said you know i thought you were going to go right into us the wing just went under our ship i said holy sheesh but and nevertheless, the blast had uh, destroyed most of the uh, airplane. Four ships went right down there. One was completely destroyed, and the others never made it back to the base except for one, and the bombardier was killed there by pieces of shrapnel who knows what so the bomb as i said the bomb blew up now comes the time when we got to get out of this thing and the, i could see flames coming we had three engines on fire our bombay was on fire it was it was crazy well, all I could think of, I got to get out of their way because they're right behind me. I could feel Vernon's foot on my shoulder. And I said, oh, I'm going, I'm going. And so I tried pulling out. I just couldn't pull out. Number one, I couldn't buckle my chest buckle because of my wounded hand. I don't know. I forget how I wounded, but I, anyway, I figured. I'll just hold it. Wrong. Wrong decision. Never having bailed out before, I didn't know or uh, imagine the force of that chute opening. Well, I ended up, thank God I had suntans on because they grabbed my legs and tighten the legs my leg my chest straps just flew open and to this day my shoulders uh give me trouble but uh i was hanging upside down thank god and so i tried to shimmy up as best i could climb up on myself and i got my a good hand up into one of the shoulder straps and that's as far as I could do and I waited till I landed and I landed all right ever having landed before <laughs> it was a first timer anyway I ripped off my medical packet from the chute and started to go <laughs> this is funny well it's not funny uh they told us when you if you should have to bail out go to the west coast and up about uh, 50 miles or so to an island a small island and there is a radio and food and everything there huh. all right anyway the ridiculousness of it. 
<laughs> too much to handle right then. Anyway, the Gurkhas, the Burmese, came with spears and arrows and everything. I wasn't about to pull out my gun there. I was completely outnumbered. And uh, pretty soon along came the Japanese. And uh, they grabbed the gun out of it and uh, tied my hands behind me and uh, walked me out towards the river, which I was just on the other side of the place we bombed. It was embarrassing because it's still smoking. And, uh, <laughs> you know, how do you deny you? <laughs> Oh, anyway, so we went in and uh, I met my co-pilot, Chet Paul, and they put us into this little tender that took us across the river to the city of Rangoon. And um, there was their movie cameras. They were, take, were probably on the Tokyo News. Anyway, uh, so finally we got into this building and they had us stay in the lobby for a minute. I saw a water fountain there. I quickly went and drank some water. I needed water, nothing was said. So they took us downstairs into the dungeons. This was an old British area and uh, Incidentally, you got time? Is it? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I don't I don't know. And Great. Uh, so we went down into the environs of the place and they put us into cells, big cells. And uh, I don't have a picture of it, so that's all right. That's Do you want right. me to show a picture of the prison here? Well, no, no, it's not that one. This okay. is one in the city. That's all right. Anyway, so uh, let's get my head together. Oh, yeah. So we go into the cells, and very frankly, we're all pretty much under the weather, as so to speak. We don't know quite what's going on. It's been a tremendous shock. And... Uh, they put another guy in with me, Ed Dow, who happened to look, I didn't know him before, he was from another crew. And he had a, a look about him that was, could have been almost Japanese in a way. But, so I played it cool, and uh, Chet Paul was next to me, uh, on the other side of the prison. So I went to the corner of my prison and said, hey, Chet, when the guard wasn't around. Yeah, who's this guy, Ed Dow? Oh, he says he's on so-and-so, uh, his crew. Oh, okay, he's an American. Yes, yes, okay. So that's, so, when the guard came, he said, you stand attention. I said, okay. Then he came by and I was sitting here, hey, you stand attention. Uh, so I stood at attention. And next thing I remember, I woke up the next morning on the floor. I don't remember a damn thing. And uh, they gave us this breakfast, whatever it was. <laughs> and then they wanted to interrogate us, but first they wanted to take us to uh, New Law. They I, I didn't know what they wanted. They, they herded us out into a courtyard, and they told us all to kneel down. So we did. And it was late at night, 
And along came this bare-chested, big Japanese guy with a sword. And they said, oh, shit. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't laughing. I laugh now. We're in deep shit here. So, uh, and they knew what they were doing. So along came the commandant, which actually relieved the pressure because he's, his uh, interpreter that was with him said in English, you are now prisoners of the Japanese and you will be taken to a POW camp, uh, prison not camp, and you will not try to escape or you'll be shot. <laughs> no way. So they herded us into these trucks and we went through this town, which was a whole bomb. My God, what a mess. Finally, we got to the prison. These enormous doors opened up. Uh, Do you want me to show a picture of the prison? Yeah. Okay. I have that one. Will that work? Yeah. That was the prison, right. And we went into the prison and uh, what happened at that point was that they took each one of us and told us to sign that we are not going to escape. My signing is going to do that. I'm going to I'm not to escape. I'll escape if I can, but I don't see how. But anyway, so my good friend, um, my good friend, now I forgot his name. Oh, jeez. Anyway, he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. He refused. He refused to sign and they beat him. He refused to sign. And we told him, you know, to tell him, look, doesn't mean a damn thing. We have fight. It's the principal. Principal be damned. You know, this is not the time for that. You got to resolve to find a way to live. Anyway, they herded us into the prisoner itself and there's one smaller uh, building and that was solitary solitary normally is one person to a cell but there were so many of us 29 of us added to what they already had <coughs> so they divided we happen to have four in our cell which in itself was a blessing because we could commiserate and talk. Mm -hmm. So we learned quickly that when a guard comes down or you hear a guard coming, you'd better be at attention, looking straight forward, not in his eyes. And that's it until he leaves. One time, it was on a Friday, the uh, guard Tarzan, who we just more than disliked, he was a terrible human being. He came by, pulled me out, into the corridor and Chet was in the next cell. He could see all this and he said, all right. And he put the gun up to my forehead and he said, okay, do. 
uh, and I, okay, no, I guess it means, okay, go shoot. So I said, okay, no. He, he, he went and clicked. Fortunately, he was just joking around, but that was no joke for me. I almost passed out. I just, uh, it was just unbelievable. And I came uh, back into my cell and I just passed out. Yeah, so. Anyway, so our time there was about three weeks. And what we would do, we had a binjo box, which was a, a box that held munitions. Okay, it was a wooden, very strong wooden box, no leaks, nothing. And that's where we would do our business. And we all took turns taking it downstairs every morning and dumping it into the trough that was there. And that's when the time I went and I happened to see through the gate of the next uh, a prison, one of the prisoners thinks this British prisoner, because I could tell by the uniform, he had arms that were, the sleeves were off and he had maggots. And uh, later on, they told me, you know, the maggots actually clean your wounds. I said, yeah. <laughs> I'd rather not have the moons. <laughs> anyway, so we dump our stuff in there and then come back up. Then from then, the next day, we have uh, interrogations in a shack. And what they do is take one person at a time, and they took me eventually, and they say, all right, uh, you're Tomasan. Yeah, I'm Tomasian. And uh, it says, you draw a picture of your base. Draw a picture of my base. Uh, so I thought a bit. And uh, what Chet had told me, he says, make up stories. They don't know. So I said, OK. So I drew a picture here and a picture of this and a picture of the plane over here, eating shack here, a tennis court there, and, you know. So they were pretty much buying it. So finally they said, all right, okay, dog. So he sent me back. Then Parmalee with his arm hanging, he came in and he was really suffering. I mean, he couldn't speak well, he couldn't. So they called me, I don't know why me, but maybe because I was the last guy there, or who knows. And so they said, you help him write down. I said, okay. So they tell me what they want to know like how many uh what's the speed of the plane and i said what's the speed of the plane and he would say something and i, I would make up a different number not knowing uh, what he would do and we went on with three five or six questions like this so finally they said okay though you're so off we went back to the back to the prison. So our days, this is what our days were made up of. And uh, when oh, when I was drawing a picture, remember I told you before I was of the base, this mm -hmm. Indian National Army guy who was collaborating with the Japanese. He said, don't lie to me. 
I know everything that's there. I said, if you know everything, what do you need me for? You know, <laughs> it's just, see, I didn't, wasn't trying to be a wise guy. I just thought, what's the yeah. point? You know, I, I was a kid. What are you going to do? Anyway, so that went. And finally, after days and days and weeks, we were ordered out of the solitary confinement area and shipped to a, a block, you know, one of those big buildings where the Indian National Army was housed. They were bunking there and they were part of the Japanese. So they were ordered, they're, they're going somewhere. All right, so they're going. Now they got this empty thing, so they figured they'd put us in there. So that's what we did. That, I cannot tell you how relieved that little, little change in the environment was so incredible. It really, it made us feel like, hey, there's hope. We're going to make it. Otherwise, they'd let us in there and to rot, you know. So I said, okay, I'm going to make the best of things. I'm going to do it. So I volunteered for the cook shack. And then I found a little piece of, uh, of iron. I don't know what you call it. Uh, uh, I'm trying to find something to show you. Uh, I can't find it. All right. Anyway, it was a piece of iron uh, where you go around the barrel, you know, and they, they, well, I broke, there was a little piece of it on the ground. And I looked at it, geez, maybe it, I could hone this. So I went up and down the wall for a week or two and uh, without causing attention. And then I said, geez, you know, I need something to really sharpen it. And my radio operator happened to be feeling around the rafters and he found this whetstone, a stone that some of the Indian National Army probably used for shaving, you know. So I, that was what made this knife a thing. Mm. And I shaved, guys, I, have, I haven't collected on all the meals that I was going to have in Calcutta. <laughs> However, it was terrific. And uh, Ozzy Osbold Stone, right, there you go, that's it. That was the night. And uh, on the last day when I was there, someone took it. I can't believe someone would have done that. Anyway, so uh, Ozzy Osbaldstone had issues with his hair, uh, bugs or something. So I said, well, look, I could shave you. So, which I did, but I had to have a boiling uh, receptacle of water, which was boiled. So that if ever I happened to nick it or cut it, I would quickly put this water on it and we did it and it was terrific he loved it and i gave a lot of haircuts and uh the wing commander i said hey winko how about it he says no tommy he he wanted to be <laughs> He was a real show off. Anyway, 
So I said, all right. So time came, I'm, I'm gonna keep bouncing ahead. A lot of things happened between there. So time came when the British were advancing down from Mandalay and the Gurkhas, you know about Gurkhas? You know about Gurkhas. Well, these people don't know. About but our audience them. might not know about Gurkhas. Right. They wouldn't know. Gurkhas are the, one of the fiercest fighters in the universe. And they are in the employ of the British. The British paid them and took care of them and uh, took care of their lives really and but they were fierce fierce fighters and the thing that was impressive uh, if they pulled like you'd see them you say oh can i see the so he says yes but i have to prick your finger he has to draw blood when he pulls that out he has to draw blood and they stuck to that. So I said, okay, go ahead. And so uh, they came down. And meantime, our people, the Japanese, were taking all the able bodied people on a march to get out of there. And they'd leave a skeleton crew, about four or five Japanese soldiers, young kids. I got to talk to them. And, the, and uh, <coughs> so <coughs> they, let's see, train of thought is, yes. So they they brought clothes, work clothes, the fatigues of the Japanese. They threw them out on the thing. So all these people had to go and uh, wear the clothes with the cap, the little cap and everything. So there was this, uh, what I call a dock worker. He was so funny. He was a British dock worker and these guys are tough i mean you never see anything tougher and uh, he got this uniform on and then he had a false tooth <laughs> he stuck it up and we all roared we said shut up <laughs> they see him they'll hang him Oh God, it was, I'll never forget that image of him. But anyway, they finally gathered everybody and I made the decision to stay, figuring, hey, with my ankle, I'm not going to be able to walk like they're walking. And they're liable to just finish me off. So I'll take my chances here. Besides here, I can take care of the little that I can do uh, with the British, you know, all the doors will be open and we could do it. So that's what we did. They went and the guards were around for a couple of days and they spoke perfect English because they were young kids. They learned English in school. And uh, finally they went and they left. Did I got time? You're Sorry. great. Yep. Oh, all right. And finally they went. And uh, came time for us to figure out what we're going to do. Maybe we should go out into the uh, environs and uh, we had the Japanese guns and rifles and things that they had left. And we went out and uh, went across the river in the little tender that the Burmese 
now being friends. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. And they, we went and talked to the other people on the other side to find ways of getting uh, vehicles or boats so that the troops that are coming down would be able to come over the over the river, which they did. And uh, at one point, there was a <laughs> a Japs gone we printed on our roof. The British didn't believe that. So when they flew over, they started to drop a bomb or whatever and it hit the outer wall. And finally they went back and then we put another word down here in another roof, extract digit. It, in British terminology, that's take your finger out of your butt. So <laughs> they knew, Japanese didn't know that. And so they wagged their wings and uh, pretty soon, a couple hours later, they dropped containers. I mean, enormous containers they parachuted down. Oh, were we sick that night. <laughs> it was too much too soon. And finally, the Gurkhas arrived. And along with the Gurkhas was this incredibly wonderful looking man. I say that because we all looked so terrible. And it's only when you see this healthy man, tall guy, and he was a newsman, and he sent telegrams home and all that stuff. And then uh, uh, it was the start of how we were going to get back. So a tender was brought to the docks and we all were ordered to gather whatever we, we had. We, I gathered my, I wanted to, keepsake my pan and my fork and knife that I had made out of wood. I brought all that and uh, I also got a gun, uh, a rifle, and uh, off we went. So we went down to the docks and there was a tender there. We were about to leave when we see a group of Gurkhas, here's Gurkhas again, right? They are running with the Japanese in front of them on the end of a rope and uh, his head was bandaged. So they came to and smiling with their gold teeth and they dumped him into the cage that was there and they opened this box that they were carrying and it was full of ears. They had cut off the ears. Sorry, I couldn't handle that. It was just too much for me. And, uh, but finally we got to the ship and on the ship, they had us go into the shower and throw out every stitch of clothing we had out the, out the window porthole into the sea. I would manage to keep my leather jacket. I don't remember just how I did it, but I did it. And uh, so finally, we went, we got to Calcutta. 
and I'm wondering how am I going to get this gut off? So I wrapped it all up in the blanket that they had given us, and it didn't look like a rifle. And so I said, uh, it's loaded the captain, you know, and off we went. And we were in Calcutta. Now, in Calcutta, the nurses that were there knew of us, knew, perhaps knew some of us. I didn't know anyone. I knew one, yeah, that's all. I think she'd give us the shots or something. And so uh, we got to the hospital. Talk about pills. I have had every color, every shape of pill imaginable. It were in the bowl, and all we did was take handfuls and plop them in. I don't know how wise or I, I didn't never gave it a thought. I mean, it must be good, right? <laughs> the doctor's doing it. But anyway, uh, I. Oh, I neglected to tell you one thing. There was a Chinese prisoner who helped dispense the food in the prison. And now he's with us in this hospital. And I went over to the Chinese barracks where they were and I tried to uh, look for her. I said do you know where Long Zong Yao is they knew exactly who he was so I said oh hi how are you? and uh, he couldn't speak English but it, well, somehow we got together he recognized me and uh, through his friend of his, he wants to know if you could write a letter to his father. I said, absolutely, I'll do that. So he got his father's address written down and everything. I said, what would you want me to tell him? And the interpreter said, tell him that he's safe and he is going to be coming home and just an aside which i really am disappointed in our military you couldn't get a c-47 to take these poor guys over the hump into china could you do that <laughs> anyway it just breaks my heart. And uh, when I got home, I wrote him a letter. And I got a letter back, one to me and one to his son. Since I didn't know where his son was, I have no idea. I found out from the military, I, I called up the proper people and they told me, oh, they were released and they walked over the Himalayas. Are you kidding me? You mean they didn't have the, oh. I, I, don't, I don't understand this kind of stuff, but that's the way that, that, that was. So finally, we got uh, all our pills and everything, and time came as you got better and able to travel. They released you, and you flew home in the C-40s, ne the next C-47 that was going there. So my time came, and I was with two other guys, two other fellows of mine, and we went to Karachi, 
uh, say, Karachi, Khartoum, Egyptian Sudan, and then over to, oh, damn it, on the, on the east coast of Spain. I forget what the name of it was. Anyway, from there, we went to uh, up north, and the docks, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the pilot, after many hours over the sea, he said, I'm going to be lowering now, and I'd like you, your three, the, three soldiers to look out the side window. And I said, oh, that should be nice. So we were approaching while, and finally we went and he lowered down to around 400 feet and around the Statue of Liberty. I cannot tell you or translate the feelings. I was home, you know. And uh, to this day, I still, that image stays with me. And uh, anyway, we landed and got our papers. And uh, what happened next? Oh, yeah, I uh, got a furlough to go home. And uh, I said, well, well, what do you mean furlough? Uh, don't I get out of the army? He says, no, you've got to have 85 points. I said, what are you talking about points? Well, you only have 80, uh, 83. You've got to have 85. Are, are you serious? Are you giving me a jazz? No, no. He said, that's, that's the rules here. I'll show you. I said, oh, my God. God, I don't believe you. And then when I went outside, I saw these uh, POWs, German POWs, with Coke in one hand and a broom in the other. I said, now that's humane. That's how things should be. Mm -hmm. I didn't, it's funny. I didn't think that was anything wrong with that. It was who we are. And it's important never to lose who we are. And so finally I got my orders, uh, my pay, uh, furlough to go home. So I got on the IRT and uh, went to uh, Washington Heights, went up the elevator to the ground floor and went around the corner to the ice cream place. And along came a, a Spalding ball. <laughs> Jesus, I like, you know those pink Spalding balls? Right, everybody knows that. Well, I had it in my hand, and along comes this kid with his hat askew, and sort of he got to be like 11, maybe 12, no, 11, and a big oversized glove in his hand. He says, give me the ball or I'll waltz one up your snot box. <laughs> oh, boy, I was home. <laughs> That was my home. Well, mm -hmm. I make a long story short, I met my grandmother and my mother came running across the street because someone saw me coming and told her. And we just, it was wonderful. Wow. Yeah. Cornick, what an amazing story. Just unbelievable. I can't thank you enough for sharing that with us. Yeah. Nor can I thank you enough there's for your service. A there's a thousand. I'm not the only one. They, they, I, 
it's unbelievable what some of these guys went through. Yeah. I had it easy, I figured. Some of these well, people in the Japanese uh, islands, mm -hmm. I don't know how some of them actually made it. You know, really, this was probably the people that were chosen to watch us were probably the dregs of the Japanese nation. These people are horrible. I mean, it's beyond being, uh, uh, what would I say, beyond being uh, protective of your country, you're animal. You're actually an animal. Mm -hmm. And it's, and oddly enough, I've, I've met many Japanese, in fact, I had Japanese clients in packaging in Osaki, America. And uh, I found them terrific. You know, it wasn't soon, you know, I'm talking about something uh, 50 years ago. And uh, It just amazes me how, when I hear, uh, we had a, a lady, a Japanese woman that was a friend of my uh, wife, and she came over, chit chat talk, and she happened to mention, I sat in on their conversation, her mother and father were in Hiroshima. When she explained different things, I had to leave the room because nobody should experience things like that. I don't care who you are. And it's no it's, it's really a shame. They they shouldn't experience that, but you know, Carnig it had to be. I, I believe that. You know, at the same time, I believe that because ultimately, if we had continued with the Japanese psyche at that time, not now, at that time, they would have fought to the last drop. Absolutely. And which meant we would have fought to the last drop. And uh, I'm afraid the ones that have to pay is the ones that started the war. Well, what we have to remember, those of us who are here now, yeah. who appreciate the freedoms and the privileges and the opportunities and the choices I have, and, and the same with our audience, we thank you and so many so many who have sacrificed and and made the ultimate sacrifice as well so that we can be here today to have these privileges thank you karnik yeah yeah those are the ones the ones that gave their lives you know those of us that made it through we're fine we have our issues some of us yet more or less than others but basically we're fine. But the mm -hmm. ones that didn't come back, their parents, their children, <laughs> on both sides, I don't care who you talk to. Uh, uh, Karnik, have you, have you got a couple minutes to answer a few questions from our audience? Do you want to grab a drink of water or anything? I've, I've taken a lot of your time. No, don't worry. It's all right. Go ahead. Okay. Leah, do you want to jump in here with some questions? Um, okay, I can. 
I've got a number of questions, so we'll see how long we can go. And if we don't get to all of the questions and you did ask one, what we'll do is pass those questions along to Carnig um, and get a response. So we'll do we'll do a couple um, and then if we have any left over, we'll we'll email you back. But the first question is from First Lieutenant Barry Cohen, who is a US Air Force pilot veteran, um, and he wants to know what became of your idiot commanding officer. Oh, uh, I, I should have told you that. Uh, when I came back a number of years later, uh, I wrote to West Point because I like to write about these things. And uh, I told them, look, I'm writing a book about uh, because at that time he was a general, uh, they made, they upped him, and uh, I'd like to have a, a background check to make sure I've got all my facts right, and to give him credit where credit is due. You know, I made it. Well, lo and behold, they send me a whole dossier. There was not one doc not one letter about this mission how do you how does one in the military be able to do this who do i blame the military system i think that's what it is it's not the guy the guy is a bum but he's within an organization so how is that organization monitored and governed? That's what I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that answer your question? Yes, I believe it does. Um, the next question um, is from Stephen Schwartz, who asked, did you forgive your captors like Louis Zamperini did? Relieve my what? Did you forgive your captors like Louis Zamperini did? Louis Zamperini um, no. had a was also a, a POW in a Japanese POW camp and, and wrote a book about how he had to come to terms with his situation and he ended up forgiving the the people who held him captive at that Japanese POW camp. So Stephen is asking, did you forgive the people who, who held you captive? No, absolutely not. These people were governed by some kind of, uh, I don't know what was training. They were terrible people, terrible. There was only one man, an older gentleman, who came by, he was like, must have been in his upper 40s, I don't know, and uh, we called him horse face because his face was such. But when he came by and we were naturally always at attention, he would just go like this, calm down, you know. He wouldn't say calm down, but he, he'd do that. And then he'd go and and show the his emblem or one of his uh, uh, what would you call it badges and on the back made in usa <laughs> he had a sense of humor but he never he just relaxed us that was the only one but i'll never forget him and today, I mean, since then, I've met many Japanese that I like and I respect. And I um, the next question is, what escape or evasion training did you have um, for flying such long missions over the Japanese-held territory? Were you guys trained um, to escape or anything like that? No. No, no. Because, you know, you got to think, number one, are you going to be captured? If you're captured, you're already 
finished. You know, it's not like they leave you in a room like you see on TV with our police and so on. No, no, there's always a couple of guys with you, with guns, etc. You are never, never at an opportunity to escape unless you were on a, a detail that took you up into the mountains, I don't know, but you still wouldn't. You know, they always told us, oh, uh, in Burma, suppose you dropped down in uh, Rangoon, Burma, and you were able to get, go east on foot to the coast, which was about 80 miles and go another 80 miles up to Misera Island, just off the coast, and then swim out there or get a boat or something to go onto the island. And there you will find, I don't know how, I forget the details, you will find uh, communication systems and food and this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> Dream world, it never happened. Um, okay, so the next question we have is, what do you think of the fact that there are two B-29 super fortresses still flying 75 years later? I think that's fabulous. And I've flown on Fifi a number of times and I love it. I had my daughter, uh, yeah, I could show you. <laughs> I don't know if this, that's my daughter flying in the B-29. That's awesome. Yeah, she loved it. She's my little baby daughter. <laughs> daughter 62. So the last question I have is there is a group of sixth graders, a sixth grade social studies class that's going to be watching this video as part of their curriculum. What message do you have to young kids growing up today? What message can you give them about, you know, what they should expect when they, they grow up as young Americans? Well, you know, that's a pretty deep question. I don't presume to be God or anything like that. But they, I think they have a very rough time right now, as everybody has. We're talking about a, a epidemic that we have not had in century. I don't know, maybe smallpox or I don't know what. But to tell you, to, for me to presume to give advice to youngsters is presuming an awful lot. And I don't care to do that. I think the best thing you can do is be careful of what you do, respect one another. You know, these are all standard things. But the world is so complex now that it behooves anybody to give other people advice. You know? Well, I think you answered that very well. Thank you very much, Karnik. We have lots and lots of people that wanted to thank you um, and appreciate your time. And we'll be sure to pass along all of those comments to you later uh, on. Have a good day. Arnick, thank you so much for the time. It's been a sincere pleasure, a special treat for me. Please stay safe, stay well. Uh, yeah. Keep growing those tomatoes, and we'll look <laughs> forward to seeing you at Wings Over Dallas one of these days soon. Oh, yeah. Next year. I'm not going down this year. I don't want to travel in planes. No, we'll see you in 2021. System. All right. All right.
thank you for all your organization. You know, you really, you know your stuff. <laughs> I don't know all this. Oh, God. I knew to be quiet and let you do the talking. You did a great job. Thank you, Carnig. Uh, See well, you soon. Big right. hugs. Thanks. Have a good life. Thank you. And take care of yourself. Goodbye. Bye bye. How do we do this?